Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. She is a graduate of this university, and she's back as one of the speakers for uh, Rosemead School of Psychology's 50th anniversary. Okay, uh, she is a psychologist who is uh, who specializes in technology. She just wrote this book called Device. Balancing Life and Technology in a Digital World. Help me welcome Dr. Doreen Dodgen McGee. All right, well, Doreen, you know, um, you are a psychologist. What made you want to study technology and its effects on us? Great question. So, after finishing at Rosemead, I quickly moved to Oregon and started a private practice when, when my husband also became um, employed in the high tech industry. And uh, as my kids were entering middle school, and then as I was welcoming my niece and nephew into the world, I was noticing that both child, very young childhood toys, were being uh, chip enabled, which took away a lot of the parent-child play that I had thought was very important for a child's development. Yeah. And then at the same time, I was noticing, at that time, flip phones coming into the um, you know, middle school scene and really disrupting the way that young adults and children were spending time together. They were almost becoming a third entity in you know, relationships. Yeah. And um, I thought, this might not go well for us. Mm. <laughs> and so just early on, I began to start keeping track of both pop culture trends and te high tech technology trends, and also looking at that through the lens of psychological developmental theory and looking at mm. peer reviewed research to see how this new, beautiful, sparkly, amazing thing yeah. was also pos possibly having some detrimental effects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, our professors around campus, they tell us all the time that technology is bad, stay away yeah. from it, things like that. Now, what are some of the tangible things that technology does to us, and how does it really affect us? Okay, so first of all, I want to take this opportunity yeah. to apologize to you all. Um, literally, I want to do this. I'm going to get on my knees. <laughs> I am so sorry that my generation, that your faculty has, you know, uh, told you how horrible technology is without also acknowledging that it is beautiful and wonderful and amazing. I feel like a lot of times we've handed you this gorgeous resource, and then we've talked smack about you for using it, all the while we are like candy crushing and checking our email, right? You know? <laughs> so, um, so I do acknowledge that there are some amazing advances and wonderful, beautiful things that technology yeah. brings to us. Yeah. There are also uh, some really um, important things we need to think about. Some of them are that not all technology is benign. And the research is telling us now and coming out in kind of greater preponderance every day about four areas of impact that technology has on us. The first is on our brain and our bodies, things like our eyes, our thumbs. Thumb mm. arthritis is real for your generation. Mm. Um, also, our brains. Um, if you look at how technology wires the brain, because where we stimulate the brain, the brain creates neural pathways, yeah. it looks as though it is kind of redirecting some of the important wiring from the parts of our brain that are related to focus, an ability to be focused, an ability to delay gratification, and an ability to regulate ourselves. So mm. that's the kind of neurological effect. It's also affecting the way in which we create relationships and the right. way in which we maintain them. Right. It's deeply affecting um, a sense of, th or the way in which we develop a sense of self. Yeah. And I think that's really important because that's also the place where we most deeply encounter God. Mm. So, um, and then the fourth area is it's just really changing the way that we either do or do not live in our skin. Mm. We live a lot more of our lives now in kind of disembodied ways where yeah. our fitness trackers tell us more about our sleep than our own physical bodies. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's unpack the third and fourth one a little bit. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. So you're talking about relational and, and just our bodies and how yeah. that, those are important things. You know, I... Um, I'm on Instagram, you know, and I think it's helpful for me to develop friends, especially connecting with our college students. So there's good effects. What are uh, some of the good things about that? But also help us understand a little bit more deeply, what are some of the things that it's doing to us and how does that affect the way we actually approach life? Yeah, so relationally, one of the, one of the analogies I like to use is that if I was gonna go for a run, which um, for me would be a stretch, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't eaten anything, and you know, I'd say I was gonna do a 5K, and I hadn't eat anything, my stomach's growl, growl, growling. Um, I could just quickly, you know, grab a bottle of water, down it, my stomach would stop growling, it would feel full, and I'd get to like... <laughs> 
half a mile. <laughs> and, and I would realize, oh my goodness, I have no calories for this run. You know, that mm. made me feel full, right. but it didn't give me the energy that I need. Right. And in a lot of ways, I think the relational, um, the, the scaffolding upon which we build our relational selves and maintain them now feels a little bit like that. We have very full relational lives, yeah. full circles in these um, digital spaces. But when we really need the kind of authentic, gritty, messy, awkward yeah. um, benefits of intimate connectedness, we don't often have that developed in the same way. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more, too. Like, how do we actually develop that? Do we just go and do it? Like, uh, is that what we do? I love that you're asking that. So a couple of things. The first thing that I think we need to do, and I spend a lot of time in here talking about this, is we need to make sure that our embodied lives, our yeah. sensual beings, yeah. meaning, you know, our touch, taste, smell, sight, are fiery. I, th I talk a lot about a fiery life. Because mm. if our only really exciting, interesting things are happening on our phones or tablets or laptops, we are going to lose ourselves there. So the first mm. thing we need to do is make sure we're taking kind of appropriate um, edgy risks that yeah. stretch us, that mature us, that bring that of God out in us. Yeah. And then in addition to that, there's just some evidence in the research that tells us if we could spend 10 minutes a day, just 10 minutes, 10 minutes. of silence, of nothingness. Um, in, in Holland, they call it Nixon, which is doing nothing beautiful or doing nothing deliciously. Mm. Um, and if we could use that time for contemplative prayer or mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. and, and the beautiful thing about the research is, is that it actually shows if we can commit to that for four months, just 10 minutes. So like the first time you go to pick up your game controller or to first time you go to log into Instagram instead saying, I'm going to set the timer instead, set it aside and take 10 minutes. If we do that consistently, we actually double the gray matter and double wow. the thickening of the myelinization in the brain in the regions that are impacted by our technology use, which is so cool and so profound that we are made with such beautifully regenerating brains. That's awesome. Yeah. 10 minutes. I could barely get to 10 seconds, yeah. right? So, Which is another really important thing. That's another way that I feel like my generation has failed, mm -hmm. um, Gen Z, is we, we tell you, you know, it's really important that you take time, but we never teach you how to do it. So that's one of my most fun things that I get to do with people is literally talk them through. Or I recently did a chapel service in a high school of 1,200 students, and I told the faculty that I was going to end it with a 10-minute contemplative sit, and yeah. they looked at me like... Is that going to work don't with high school so. students? Yeah. But you get them all down on the floor and you talk them through a 10 minute exercise and they love it. Mm. So there are resources out there for everybody and a lot of them are in, listed in here or on my website, but where you can actually get the help to develop the tool because it, it's like any other muscle. If you don't work it, mm -hmm. it won't be there when you need it. Yeah. I mean, technology addiction is a real thing. Can you give us some of the symptoms and what to look for even in ourselves? And, and maybe we are techno technologically addicted. What, what, what does that look like in us? Well, it's really interesting because actually the mental health community or, and the health community have not coded technology use addiction as a I just codable did, though, diagnosis. So. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. But the interesting thing is the World Health Organization last October actually did qualify video game addiction as a diagnosable addiction. So okay. I think this is coming. Um, it, it looks like if we can't, um, if we're overly dependent upon our device, I even think if you can't go into a restaurant without reading five Yelp reviews, you have a problem. Like, <laughs> you know, we need to be able to have some spontaneity without our device. If we can't get anywhere without Google Maps, yeah. If we don't remember any phone numbers, if we get jittery or if we are overly preoccupied with either our life in our game that we're playing or social media or whatever and can't be present, that would be another sign. Yeah. And then the other issue, there is some neurological and physiological impact where literally le or, or you need more stimulation to get the same kind of a feeling of satisfaction yeah. over time. You kind of inoculate yourself to lower levels. So those are the things I Great. would say. What are some practical things we can do to prevent some of these bad habits that you just listed? Fantastic. First thing is to practice. To literally practice when you're in line or when you're waiting for class to start not taking your phone out. And instead, maybe practicing looking up and around. You know, Rather than pointing out awkward moments, create them <laughs> and live through them. Um, maybe carrying a little moleskin in your back pocket or in your backpack that you can actually write in. Um, filling your dorm room or your home or your office with a, a little bowl on your coffee table that has things 
things like kinetic sand or a yo-yo or, um, you know, little things that you can actually touch. Yeah. Um, making sure that you pay attention to the things that you taste and the things that you hear. Um, keeping your whole body engaged in the world and just doing that in small ways over time. Even any time you reach for your phone and don't take it out or don't unlock it, it's a win. It's wow. a practice in just trying a new way of being. Great, great. We are going to answer some questions, Doreen. Okay. Okay, here we go. Here's our first question. I want to be part of social media for the good things about it, but I often get caught up and spend hours on it. How can I balance that without completely deleting the app? Oof, that's a good question and a hard one. Um, what I find is that even if we can set some good parameters for ourselves or set goals, and maybe uh, now, especially with a lot of the tracking software that comes loaded onto phones, set a goal for yourself to maybe diminish your time a little bit and see if you can't move from um, having an established social media habit into um, kind of executing some new norms. So mm. maybe you say, I'm only going to check social media twice a day, and each of those times I'm going to set a timer for 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, or, uh, you know, something like that. Um, sometimes, for a lot of people I'm hearing, especially if they're very, very um, dependent upon their use, it's very hard to do that. In fact, some, some of the first research that has uh, come out yet that shows not just a correlation between depression, feelings of loneliness, feelings of agitation, and fears of missing out yeah. um, not, aren't just correlated with high social media use, but actually that high social media use causes wow. those things. And so because that is that research is out there now and we know that to be true, I do think it could be worth taking a complete break. You can pause most social media platforms rather than just deleting. Yeah. You can delete the app but keep the presence and then maybe uh, give yourself at least 21 days to kind of purge from one habit and then set some new norms for yourself and try again. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Should we be concerned for the five-year-olds with iPads <laughs> everywhere they go? Yes, okay. <laughs> what are the potential downfalls? Yeah, uh, um, yes. Screen exposure, especially at young ages, has a profound impact on the brain, and that's yeah. everywhere in the research. Um, Again, if we go back to what the most profound impacts across the lifespan are neurologically from um, overexposure to screen time or to technology, it's, it's in those three areas of inability to focus. So our ability to focus is d diminished significantly, even since I was at Rosemead yeah. 25 years ago. Um, you know, We were doing research at that point on can a child of three to five years old focus on one thing for five minutes? Now mm. we're asking, can they focus on one thing for 30 seconds? Wow. In the, in the clinical research. Wow. Um, so focus and then the ability to delay, which is really important for life satisfaction and success, that I can have a question like, who was in that movie and not Google it? That's yeah. like significant anymore. And so especially when that's happening at younger ages, um, yeah. it just diminishes the developmental trajectory more over yeah. time. And then finally, the ability to regulate. So there's some pretty profound research from for uh, around young children who game that literally when they have their first entree into school, whether that be preschool or, or uh, kindergarten, that when they are without a device and with just a single teacher in a classroom, they actually are agitated to the wow. point that they will have uh, jitters and shakes. Yeah. I mean, this is hard because I have an eight-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son, and my daughter, we, we kept iPads away from her. And then when she got to school, she's taking tests on iPads, and she didn't know how to do anything where everyone else was figuring it out. So it was like, wait, how do we get her into school well, but not, you know, keep iPads away? You it know? is a huge dilemma right now. Okay. The one thing I will say it, for any parents who are listening, um, parents will ask about that, you know, like, should I train them? Yes, we need to train our kids to be wise and um, uh, moderate in their use, but also a child will catch up with technology in a day. So it's better to hold it back and have them have a little adjustment yeah. during school. I mean, she's better on my iPhone than I am, so, <laughs> all right. So here yeah. we go, here's another question. Can you briefly take us through a mindfulness practice, or mindfulness practices? I would love to. Whoever submitted that question, thank you. Okay, wherever you are, just put your feet on the ground, your hands maybe on your um, legs, feel the weight of your body on your chair. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. And we're just going to breathe in through our noses and breathe out through our mouth. And as you do that, I'd like you to imagine the internal cavity that is your body is this empty vessel. And it's, let's imagine that it is full of tension and stress and pressures in the day. 
when you bring something into a, a closed system, into a vessel, something has to leave it. So I'd like you to imagine on the next inhale through your nose that you are breathing in peace, softness, a lack of tension, maybe God's love. And then when you exhale, because that has had to create this open spaciousness, when you exhale, breathe out all the tension, all the stress, maybe all the lies you tell yourself, you're not valuable, you're not beloved. And keep breathing in spaciousness, love, grace, till it crowds out a little more tension or lies on your exhale. And now on this next inhale, try to bring in so much peace and love that it fills up at least 51% of that closed system that is your body. Exhaling out any tension or stress or lies. And then imagine and, and kind of memorize what this feels like and know that this is a tool you can come back to at any time. And then if you want to, you can open your eyes and rejoin us. But you can see that just in two or three minutes, that was probably two minutes, maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a minute. If you do that two or three times a day, that's your 10 minutes, yeah. and it develops this increased ability to bring yourself to that regulated state. Anytime you need it to study, or to pray, or yeah. to focus, it's a beautiful yeah. practice. And just to recognize, this is something Christians have been doing over thousands of years. This is Jesus prayer, the breath prayers. This yep. is just praying the hours. This is something we've done historically. It's just we've kind of like thrown that out. Amen. There are links on my uh, website to a couple of experiences that are kind of like contemplative prayer experiences and mindfulness experiences that are that 10 minutes that anyone can access at any time. And there's also um, the Mindfulness Awareness Resource Center at UCLA also has some great downloadable free um, experiences like that. All right, great. Here's another question. Okay, it's two questions actually. Okay, where did you get your shoes? Okay. <laughs> and then how can we challenge, teach other generations to create awkward moments? Oof. Well, one of the awkward moments is answering where I got my shoes. Um, <laughs> I, their dance goes, and if you would all please take out your phone right now and text Dance Go and tell them to make them again, that would be amazing. Because people stop me on the street about these shoes and these glasses, and they don't make them anymore, and I want a new pair. So if you could get on that with me, that'd be helpful. <laughs> Secondly, uh, what was the second part? <laughs> oh, awkward moments. There's one right there. Um, we create them by inviting people into them. And that's how it is, I think, with fiery lives as well. If we don't, if we're not willing to, you know, maybe next time I, if I get to come back to Biola, I'll do a cartwheel on the stage or something. You know, like if we don't create awkward moments and then show that they are live throughable, we don't invite other people to have them with us. So I encourage people to live wildly out loud, yeah. knowing that you're going to desperately embarrass yourself sometimes, um, but that that is in the service of authentic connection yeah. and inviting people into being able to live this way instead of living this way. Yeah. I mean, the phone and technology is so curated, right? So we lose that awkward failing feeling. Yes. And that's just part of being human, isn't it? Yes, and one of the things I find so interesting is that the places in social media specifically that show the more um, not curated, authentic moments, yeah. Snapchat, um, Insta stories disappear. Mm. So we, we maintain a curated presence, but the places where we are willing to share our more authentic moments disappear over time. And that's, I think, a bummer. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here's another question. Uh, due to people becoming so reliant on all of the technological advances in our society today, could you see it growing into anything like Black Mirror? <laughs> I actually can. Um, it's so interesting. I personally can't watch Black Mirror because I already am so immersed in the research and, the, and, and both the pop culture research and high tech research and then the psychological research that I'm already depressed a lot of the time. Um, so I don't need Black Mirror to terrify me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I really don't. Um, but one of the beautiful things in the last, uh, you know, so this was 15 years of me traveling around the world talking about this and doing small research circles, some of them at Biola. Um, and it was really interesting. I was talking about the, the Black Mirror episode where they were chipped, they, people were chipped, and mm -hmm. this was at a small Christian college in, I think, Ohio. And everybody kind of started buzzing, and it turns out that they have a couple chipped students um, who have, you know, are experimenting with what it's like to have an implanted chip. Um, 
everything on Black Mirror that I know of so far is existing someplace in the world already. Um, You know, China has its social scores that it lives by that's all based on curated information from um, your digital profile. So, yes, I think it could occur. That's why I'm so desperate to get to talk to people in not a shaming or tech is horrible way, but instead in this way that says, let's think about being moderate, let's think about being really discerning before we engage new technologies, setting new norms and holding ourselves to them, and then enriching our wild embodied non-tech lives. Love it, love it. All right, here's another question. You said social media causes depression. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so the research came out of um, University of Pennsylvania, I think. And it it basically showed that um, in in all study participants, even those that were not in the research group, but became aware of how much time they were spending, and they they all diminished or decreased their time, um, and that impacted significantly their pre-test scores on depression. Mm. Um, And the way that they did the research, they can show that kind of as as social media use amps up that sense of depression, agitation, fear of uh, loneliness, or l- fear of missing out, yeah. and kind of agitation increases. So there's this kind of, co- there's been a correlational relationship for a long time. Yeah. But this is kind of our first foray into saying actual causation. Yeah, going from correlation to causation is huge. It's significant. Yeah. It's huge. Okay. Here's another question. How can we work to rebuild our focus if we find ourselves unable to be patient because of how we are so used to immediate answers oh, from technology? You guys are genius and brilliant. That's amazing. Um, we just have to start doing it. So we just have to literally start. <laughs> I, I love to say if we would all become willing to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable, mm. that would change everything. So if we would be willing to sometimes not know the answer and sometimes try to struggle and get it in our own mind rather than Googling it, or um, like I said before, you know, keeping a, a small notebook and writing down a real uh, an embodied list rather than a digital list or Um, anything that forces us to kind of use the resources that are actually attached to us and that will also redirect us to uh, the message indicators that were given to us in our bodies rather than the message indicators and the the easy, convenient opportunities here, I think will help grow focus. But it is something that we have to be patient with ourselves and patient with others because we are going to be less available to others if we're less attached here, and we're going to need to prepare them for that, and we're going to need to be more patient and um, generous and graceful with ourselves, um, because we're just not going to be able to be as efficient. One thing I suggest is everybody committing to, if you can't commit to a whole day, commit to an hour of doing one thing at a time, which means if you're listening to the podcast, that's the one thing. Mm. Or if you're listening to a song, that's the one thing. Or Mm. if you're studying, that's the one thing with nothing else. You will grow your ability to focus and delay massively um, if you just can commit to that one practice. Yeah, I love that you make it so simple sounding, but (laughs) it is still hard to make that leap to do that one simple thing. It is, it is. All right, here's another question. What are the effects of the access? Oh, changed my mind. Okay, here's another question. Can you please speak to the dangers and addictive nature Mm -hmm. of high-speed internet porn? How, how the overload changes the brain in a strong, addictive nature, and also the God-given hope that the brain can change and be healed from this through neuroplasticity. Yeah, I think the, I can address that uh, pretty quickly by just saying that the way in which most people now uh, view porn is that they view it in about 10-minute chunks, if you look at the statistics, and within that 10 minutes, uh, the average person accesses 13.3 sites, meaning that that there is this constant changing of the stimulation in the brain, which again redirects wiring into the more kind of um, huh. reptilian part of the brain. You know, it, it it it's like how we view most media now, where we don't have sustained focus on anything. Um, So it does push the wiring in the brain, if you know about the four quadrants of the brain, roughly into the lower left um, region. The beautiful thing is, again, if we can break that habit, which is very, very hard to break, I have such immense empathy, immense empathy for people who find themselves really, really pulled toward and addicted to um, porn, because um, it impacts us neurologically, it impacts us physiologically, and those things are very hard to to correct or to write, mm-hmm. to change, but it's possible. And again, if we can um, c- cut out 
our um, use for around 21 days. And at, during that time, make sure we are attending to our bodies and our minds in beautiful ways, feeding them all kinds of beautiful images, yeah. um, feeding our body really fiery food and making sure we smell really potent things, <laughs> literally just giving our body yeah. other forms of stimulation, um, we can typically see that habit uh, being broken. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. If you, can, if you challenge our entire campus to do one thing, either give up a technology or pick up a new practice for one month or maybe for Lent, what would it be? Oh, oh. You guys are genius. Um, I would say that 10 minutes, committing to a 10 minute time and holding each other accountable. Maybe you, um, you know, ask or you, you tweet out, you know, everybody do your 10 minutes right now. But that 10 minutes of, of doing nothing deliciously, mm. um, it, because it has such a profound impact across all the domains that are affected by our tech use. And it, it will allow us to be able to be present to everything, to our studies, to our work, to our friends, to ourselves, to our God. Um, that would be the thing. All right, all right. Well, Doreen, the last question we always ask is what biblical principles or passages have influenced your thoughts for today? Oh, I love it. Um, I think two things come to mind. The first is the concept of being still and knowing. Yeah. And that we have offloaded a lot of knowing onto our devices. Mm. And that there is this other kind of knowing that can never be found there. Mm. And one of the things that I think of as the most um, potent way of knowing is encounter. And that's what I find so deeply compelling about Jesus is that he just encountered, he encountered life and he encountered people and he encountered himself and he encountered his parent. You know, um, there is such critical need for us. I, I think about this a lot. I think about the idea of what I call a sacred circle. And I like to think about there's this circle around me that I draw that is a sacred circle. And anything that comes into that circle is there to teach me something. Yeah. And if I don't know how to be still and how to listen well and how to encounter deeply, I don't get to learn. I don't get to encounter that of God in this other person that has come toward me. And I think we very often live very counter to that example that Jesus uh, poses, where we think anything that comes toward us, we're supposed to teach, yeah. um, rather than we are supposed to encounter, kind of settle in, mm. be still, know. Mm. I think that's how I would answer that I question. I love that, I love that. Help me think, Dr. Doreen Dodger mcgee today. Thank you. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.